Okay, this is part four of our IPAMS USA series. This is Ryan Womack, data librarian at Rutgers University Libraries. Uh, you can take a look at the first three parts of this series. First part covering the background of what's in IPAMS. Uh, the second part covering the easy abacus online data retrieval tool. And the second covering the more involved SDA uh, tool. But now we're, we're going to the, the centerpiece, the main event of looking at customizing your own data extracts and extracting them. So again, I'd like to remind you of the other data that's available here, the full count data, the slave samples, um, linked census data. There are, there are many interesting additions here, but we're focusing right now on the 1790 to 2010 census and the American Community Survey data from 2000 to the present. Now, one thing to note here is the documentation is really fantastic. Um, we have a user guide that covers IPM's own tutorials, which are going to be more expert and more detailed than what I'm giving you here as a complete introduction. So I really um, encourage you to take a look at those. Those can um, really solve specific problems very quickly. Um, the other issues involved in this type of data uh, are really quite, quite interesting and intriguing. Um, the one thing that I'll mention, so as an example of harmonized data over time, um, it becomes very difficult to, you know, go back consistently decade after decade and retain um, consistency among things like occupational classification. So you can get the original occupational classifications um, in the data set, but IPMS has its own harmonized scheme where they will align, you know, the changing descriptions over time, right? You know, you don't have computer programmers uh, back in 1950 in the, you know, official records. But what is a um, similar broad job category for that? You can, can take a look at the information here under the occupation and industry variables to see the entire discussion of how they have mapped going forward, all of these, these things, so that we can have one reasonably consistent occupational classifier variable going back decades. And, you know, they have essays on how they have handled this material. Um, very interesting stuff. Um, there's another category uh, for um, social and economic indicators, right? So when, when we look at our data, we're going to find that things like income are not consistently recorded all the way back. Yet, they have created an, an occupation-based proxy for some of that socioeconomic status. That is something that you can use that's consistent across many, many decades of time. Um, there are lots of interesting things that they've done with the data, uh, and I really encourage you to, to dig into that. Now, one thing that you might want to be might, might be interested in just right off the bat, uh, we're going to dig into the select data option in just a moment. But when we select the data, we want to understand which data we're choosing. Where are we picking it from? Um, so we can go into the other documentation here. The sample descriptions are brief descriptions of you know what each of these items is. Now the American Community Survey stuff does not change that much over time, but um, you know, if we want a, a more precise definition, what's the difference between a one-year and a three-year and a five-year sample in ACS? Um, this will let us know that you know a one-year sample is a one in a hundred sample, and the smallest geographic unit that we can zoom in on, given the, the size of that sample, is what's called a Puma. Puma is a public use metropolitan area. That's a kind of 
approximation if you've heard of standard metropolitan standard statistical metropolitan statistical areas um it's similar to that but it's the way they've defined it based on the acs data uh, but we can't go down below a hundred thousand people right so if you want to study a small county uh, a small town you're, you're not going to be able to do that here that's actually fairly typical of this sample data um, but you know we can ask those questions of every group right so we have a 10 percent sample from 2010 but it still does not um, let us drill down beyond the puma um, that's probably going to be fairly consistent uh, for the the puma is something that has been defined in many of the recent samples um, for that purpose so you know you could certainly study something like new york city going back a long way uh, but you know more precise information uh, is is not as easy to get but you know we may have some questions like when we look at the 1970 data oh look there's a lot of one percent samples there's a form one state form two state form one metro form two metro uh, when we go and look at that uh, these were set up in order to try to identify particular areas right so if we're interested in metro areas we want to choose the metro sample we can get down to metropolitan areas uh, at least 250,000 uh, in population. The state sample is um, lets us get down to the state level as our smallest unit, and that may be may be just fine for you know your purposes. But you know you need to understand what you're after, what you're looking for. Um, these will. Um, let you define that also you'll notice that the variables are somewhat different between form one and form two um, you know now in the american community survey era the they don't do that they don't have separate groups but you know they were trying to cover a few more topics a few more questions so they they split them and you'd want to study what's on each form if you really want to be precise about that so so that sample description goes all the way back through the beginning through the um the link data, the 1790 data, um, all that stuff. Um, the questionnaires also uh, go back to 1850. This is actually a really easy place, even if you're doing census research on some other site. The collection of census guides and materials here is just fantastic, right? So if we want to see the 1970 uh, questions, we can go in and we can just see them right here online uh, how people filled those out this often gives you an easier way to understand the questions than the, than a code book which sometimes has a little bit more abstract presentation um, but so we can check all that and we can also check the actual published census volumes right so the census used to come out in big print books multi-volume sets that represented the, the aggregates, the tabulations of the census. Um, also a great way to kind of understand, well, what exactly is available? We can easily get every single volume here online um, to take a look at the, you know, what did the census record as the characteristics of population? Um, let's look at 1970. Uh, let me not pick New Jersey because it has a part one and part two. Let me pick a tiny state that would be easier to browse. Let me do Alaska. Uh, unfortunately, that's also broken up into sections, so I won't uh, show all these off to you. Um, but the PDFs are here. Um, and the way my system uh, is set up, it sort of shunts the PDFs to my downloads folder. So I'm not actually going to open these up uh, right now online. Um, but you can see that it's all here, um, really fantastic, uh, better organized than what's, what you can find on the census site itself. Um, and we'll see another example of this, you know, fantastic data organization coming up when we, when we have the session on NHGIS. So if you like this, you, uh, come back for the NH, NHGIS section, session, uh, that also has some pretty spectacular data collections. Um, all right, so, you know, all this detail is available to guide you through the data. 
And now let's go and get the data. Let's get the data itself. We want to uh, go to either select data or browse and select data. These are the same thing uh, up top or down on the left. And we must register and log in for this. So again, if you don't have an account, register, give IPMs your information um, so that they can make the case to the grant funders that people are using this, this data actively for research. Uh, if we go to log in, um, I've got my credentials memorized, so it's um, it signs me back in. You can see welcome Ryan. Uh, now I can change and you know edit my account information. And now this interface is really uh, it's very detailed, but I think it's fairly simple, fairly straightforward. Um, if you've used other sort of research type interfaces like WRDS for business data, um, to me it reminds me of that a bit. Um, and so we have these buttons basically that we can step through to select our data. I would encourage you to click on select samples to start with because if you don't, what it's going to default to is, is getting a little bit of everything. It's going to take one data set for every year that's available. Uh, but it, first of all, you may not, if you don't need everything back to 1850, please don't request that. It, it just slows everything down. It'll take longer for your data extract to, to create. And you'll be left with all this extra data that's really not very useful uh, to you uh, in, in your work, right? So you, you um, it, it'll be vastly to your benefit to uncheck this box for the default sample and be very specific and intentional about what you'd like. So I'm going to kind of try to do a study uh, of some very rough things at 50 year intervals. I'm going to take the latest ACS data, uh, just the one year sample, 2019. I'm going to go back to 1970 and I'm looking for the state level data. I'm not going to try to do anything fancy at lower ge geographic levels. Um, I'm not sure what's in each form yet, so I'm going to play it safe and I'm going to click both of those, the 1% state form, form 1 and form 2. Uh, for 1920, I just have one choice. It's a 1% sample. Um, and I'll also grab 1870, a 1% sample. Now, I'm going to stick with the 1% sample just for consistency, but you might ask yourself, well, what is this 1.2%? Okay, all these we can click on them and get a description. Um, what we what happens in the 1870 sample is a oversample of the Black African American population. Uh, so again, because we're sampling, we're not getting the entire population. We for certain smaller subpopulations, you know, we have to make sure we we get enough in the sample to produce accurate results. So when, when we correct for this, it's called oversampling, right? So that the African-American population has been sampled at twice the rate as the uh, remaining population, uh, majority white population. And so that the final results are not, uh, we have enough in our sample to do accurate counts when we slice and dice it some more. Um, but we weight the sample, right? So in this case, we would downweight the, the calculation. Like if I say, how many people over 80 were there in 1870 living in New Jersey? And I come out with the raw data that says um, 1,000 whites and 1,000 African Americans. The raw, if the raw data says that, that actually means that since African Americans have been oversampled double in a double ratio, that seeing 1,000 in the data uh, implies that we have only 500, an estimate of 500 African Americans in the actual population. And so the weights are ways that you can automatically apply that correction uh, to your results. Um, so again, when you're seriously concerned about precise results, you want to understand all that. 
Is your sample weighted? Is it not? Who does it cover? Um, who does it not? The linked data, right, it sounds very enticing when you look at that because they're actually linking families across all of the, the years. Now that might be useful for some research, but think about it. If, if I say I'd like to link uh, across four decades, I then miss everyone who might have died or just not been available, dropped out um, of the survey um, somewhere along the way. Those people might be different than the people who stay in the survey, maybe those who stay in one place for four decades. Um, new immigrants wouldn't show up. You know, there are a lot of things that you could, that are missing from a linked set that are not, um, we, we may not think about that at first, but all I'm advising you to do is be careful and intentional in, as to how you select your data. All right, so I have gone with these samples uh, 2019, 1970, 1920, and 1870. I'll say submit. And so it says samples have been selected. Now select your variables. We just have these three pull downs. Um, if we are seasoned IPMS users and we have gotten familiar with this, we might know the variables right off the top of our head. And we, we know, okay, we'd like to see the A's, please. And I'd like to grab age off of the A's. Um, so that's possible to just use the A to, A to Y list. There is no variable that begins with Z. Uh, we can also search. It's not a super sophisticated search, right? We, we have to either get something in the variable name or in the variable label. So be a little careful with that. It's a great way to discover things, but just be careful. It might not be exhaustive. Um, but you know, usually I would prefer to go using these pull-down tabs. If we are interested in things at the household level, we have this pull-down where we can find um, things like, you know, household characteristics, household, uh, the, the, the house itself. Is it mortgaged? Is it rented? What are the costs? What is the household income level? Um, is it public housing? Things like that. Uh, over time, there have been various questions asked, you know, as technology spreads through American society. Um, did you have, do you have a radio, right? They used to ask that question. Uh, it was asked in 1930. Uh, in our particular sample, it was asked in 1970, uh, but it's no longer asked. They no longer bother to ask whether people have a radio. Uh, but back in 1970, they asked whether you had a television set whether it was UHF equipped, right? Ultra high frequency, that was where like extra channels on the high end, just like AM and FM. <laughs> FM was the new technology at one point. Um, so you'll see this, this historical um, changes um, over time. Now they're asking about internet, computer, saw, smartphone. Um, they used to ask about a clothes washing machine. <clears throat> And so if those interest you, you know, those are the types of things that are at the household level. Um, but I'm going to focus on person level data. And you can see there's a few more car categories here. The technical uh, category <clears throat> lets you do things like collect the person identifier number, right? That's just something that we could use to link one of the things we could use to link across data sets, uh, but you, again, you, that's not for amateurs. You want, you want to really be careful about that. Um, the weights are here, right? So person weight is, as it says, this is pre-selected um, because, you know, they know that people are going to go back and need that information. Usually, actually, the person number, at least as a unique identifier of each row in your data can be useful. So... Um, we'll, we'll keep that. Uh, these pre-selected ones will come into your data set no matter what, but by checking them, I'm just sort of confirming that. Um, and I didn't mention explicitly, but you know the, the selection method is super easy, right? We just check or uncheck the variable. Uh, and we then we see it in the cart. It's just like a shopping cart. I've now uh, chosen five samples, my years that I'm interested in. So far, only one variable. 
Um, and this little chart on the right shows me which years the data is available for. So if I was browsing, right, if I had left um, all the years checked, uh, that might be one way to just sort of eyeball and see where is the data most complete for the variables I'm interested in. Um, I might use that to make help me make my year selections. But let, let's continue with the selection process. So we have person, um, family, relationship, right? We, we have um, number of family members in the household. We can attempt to link them to their children and parents. Um, again, I'm not going to go into those kind of technical um, aspects. Uh, under demographic, I'm just going to collect some basic things. So I'm, I collected age. I'm also going to ask for sex. Um, that's, that's all I'm going to ask. I'm, there's marital status, um, number of children. Um, and again, we want to be careful. Uh, I want to, to the extent possible, collect the information that is present across all years. And I'm going all the way back to 1870. So that's <clears throat> non-trivial. So at least for demonstration purposes, I'd like to keep this simple. All right, that's demographic. Here's race and ethnicity. And again, you know, the, the codes that, that have been used for race across, you know, they, they seem to change almost every census. Um, but what IPAMS has done has been to collapse them into the uh, fairly standard major categories that persist across many um, censuses. Uh, and th those are these nine. But you can see that comes out of a base of 252 categories that are present um, going back in time. If we take one example here, uh, Alaskan natives, right? In 2019, we no longer use Eskimo. Um, in 1970, they did. And in 1920, the only thing that they were uh, marking off uh, was Alaskan mixed. So they didn't distinguish um, at all there. Um, 1870, that was not something chosen, right? So we can't actually get down to that level of specificity to find out who the Alaskan natives were in 1870. It just wasn't tracked. Um, and so, again, all the detail is, is here on the site. You can dig in and figure out the answers to your questions um, as to how things were classified back in time and how they are now. Uh, so race is just one example of those. Um, all you need to do to click is click through on the codes button um, to see how those codes have um, changed over time. And these other tabs that I'm not even looking at uh, discuss many more of those methodological issues. So again, I encourage you to dig in and understand these details for the variables you care about. Um, fantastic documentation, um, a, a pleasure to use actually. Uh, so under race and ethnicity, let me just take race and Hispanic origin because those are available for all five years easily. Um, I'm not going to attempt to get into any other details. I am going to skip health insurance, go to education. I mean, obviously, we're not going to review every single variable in this video. Um, and notice here, this is one where the data is a bit less complete. Um, I can get educational attainment back to 1970. I'm going to select that because I have at least three out of the five. But I'm also going to select school attendance. So educational attainment is a measure of the you know level achieved. Did they complete a certain grade of school? Did they get to college? Did they complete multiple years of college? Um, the school attendance is simply checking off whether they are in school at that time period. Um, so different sort of thing, but I'm, I'm going to grab it. Let's look at work. 
this is a really fascinating category. Um, I'm going to take labor force status. This is whether someone is in the labor force, whether they're attempting to work. They might be employed or they might be unemployed, you know, seeking work, but in the labor force. This is at least is very consistent going back to 1870. And I'm going to take occupation. Now, occupation is one of these categories that gets recoded so that it matches all the way across the database. Um, we can also use prior years classifications if we'd like, uh, but I'm just going to stick with occupation. Right? So the codes here will be uh, pretty detailed. You know, there's many different occupations, so I'm not going to drill down into that. Um, but it's, you know, it's another uh, major harmonization work that is done here. We also, we can get this information about how much did people work, um, you can see designated homemaker. That's not something they ask uh, anymore. Um, you know, the changes over time are also indicative of changes in society. Uh, let's look at income. And I'm going to pick because it, it's fairly standard and at least is available for recent years is income total, total personal income. So that's the entire uh, income that the individual receives regardless of source as the sources are itemized down here below. And the final one I'm going to look at is occupational standing. This is that scoring system that I was telling you about. So I'm going to just choose the one occupational income score. There's actually several other um, methods that people propose. You know, what they do is they sort of ask people they asked people at the time, you know, to rank occupations. What do you think, it, you know, does a doctor make more than a teacher? Or, um, and they, they use those rankings as an approximation of um, something correlating with income. Um, as it says here, there is significant debate about the usefulness of these measures. Um, there are several different versions of them, and you can read their discussion of this issue uh, for more information here. Uh, but I do find it fascinating that this is, uh, you know, they make this available to you. Uh, one way to, comp to get historical income type information when um, at, at the microdata level when it's it's definitely not available in terms of income itself. Um, you know, so they also, you know, ask people about um, where were you born? Where did you come from? A uh, lot of information like that. It tends not to be too super consistent over time, so I'm not going to um, dig deep into that. Uh, you can you can see these categories. Um, th I. I, again, I can just emphasize that they have done the best possible job of of bringing this information together. If IPUMS couldn't make the the data available in this comparable standardized form, there's a good reason, and you probably don't want to be messing with that data yourself because um, you know it it has some issues that really make it not comparable uh, in this format. So these are the harmonized variables, but again, the originals are there. So if we say, you know, I would also like to see those original occupational classifications before IPMS has transformed them into modern terminology, maybe I want to see where they're using um, the word homemaker in uh, the, the answers. Uh, so I can actually go into the source variables. I can pull them from the specific years of my earlier census, um, and I can get those too. So I can pull those to look at them at the same time. Uh, again, I'm going to keep my focus on the harmonized variables. Um, the display options here are, I never really mess with this when I'm choosing data, uh, but we, we can change how the data is grouped. We can do a little bit of stuff here. 
All right, now I'm done. I've selected my data. I've got many things checked off and I can go to my cart and see what have I got. And here's a nice summary of what I have. I have uh, for, uh, again, some of those pre-selected things, which we're probably not going to use in our analysis, uh, come in, but they're the technical variables that uh, you, you need to have just in case, in case you need to um, apply certain weights, in case you need to know uh, if some group quarters, if you're not familiar with census data, group quarters means things like uh, prisons or uh, monasteries or nunneries or uh, dormitories for students. Um, and, you know, those are most of the group quarters are distinctive populations that are a bit special. Like if we say, what do people who live in Middlesex County, New Jersey, what are they like? Um, we're, we may not be thinking about the people in the dorms or in the prisons when we ask that question. We might want to exclude the group group quarters. Um, so they, they, you know, they throw things like that in the data, all these pre-selected ones. Um, and so the ones that are not pre-selected are our topical variables of interest, sex, ace, rage, sex, age, race, <laughs> Hispanic origin, school attendance, educational attainment, labor force status, occupation, total personal income, and occupational income score. You can see that for most of those, we, we're pretty complete. There are three variables that are not complete, um, but they tend to be pretty good for the recent years. So I'm satisfied with this. We can always use the add more to go back and revise. We can uncheck things if we'd like at this stage. Very flexible, very nice. When we're ready to go, we click Create Data Extract, and <clears throat> we have a, a, a request here. Um, I've actually already created one of these samples, uh, so you'll see it in just a moment, but I'm just going to call this the second extract. And I can do things like change the data format um, I think I will uh, change it to CSV format this time around. Um, Stata, SPSS, and SAS are supported pretty consistently throughout IPMs as well. Um, and I can mess around with the data structure. Particularly, this is important if I'm interested in that household structure. If I'm interested at the person level, I don't want to mess with this. I want to leave it as a rectangular data file at the person level. Okay, so I'm going to change that. Now I have a CSV file and size is going to be about a gigabyte, right? This is not small. It's it's all, uh, even though it's a 1% sample, it's a 1% sample of the entire US. So, you know, you're talking about uh, often like a million or two million um, entries, right? This is, we, we have to um, work with this data. There's a tip here if you want, if we want to reduce the abstract, the extract size, we can do that um, by selecting cases, right? If we're only interested in, you know, one state or males versus females, um, we can, we can apply those filters according to certain instructions. Um, and we can also sort of downsize our sample that limits our analytical power at the same time, but we, we, we have that option to do it as well with customized sample sizes. So those are things to be aware of. I mean, I didn't set, select a lot of variables. This is another reason why you don't want to select every year. Uh, if you don't need every year, please don't, don't do it because you're going to get a giant jumbo file that um, will be pretty hard to handle. Um, we can do a few other things. So, so reducing the ac extract size, uh, we could select uh, certain things, like we, we might say only those of Hispanic origin, right? We could check that off and then walk through this process to filter on that variable. Um, I'm just going to keep the whole sample here, though. I'm interested in the full extract. Um, 
I'm not going to attach additional characteristics. Uh, the customized sample size um, lets us filter, um, like if we want a smaller percentage, right? If we say instead of 3 million people from the 2019 ACS, I, I'd like to just keep that at, at 1 million. What it will do is it will randomly sample <clears throat> from the entire 3 million and adjust the weights appropriately. Um, and we can see, okay, that shrinks our file size down to 732. I really don't want to do that. I want to actually work with a realistic large file, so I'm, I'm not going to make any change there. I'm just going to go back. Um, and I'm going to say CSV format. The data quality flags, um, again, I, I didn't mention that, but that's, that's another option that we have. When we hit submit, we go to our next phase and <clears throat> we can see um, that we've got a list of files for processing. Um, I have some old stuff here. Uh, as it notes here that the data itself is available for about 72 hours. So you don't want to leave things sitting up here forever. But what they will do is they will keep the instructions practically indefinitely. I mean, I don't know if there is a plan to expunge these, but, um, you know, I have these samples that were created in 2015. I can take a look at what I requested and I can run the request again to pull a fresh uh, data set. So this takes a little while. Uh, as we saw, it's quite a large data set. So I say a little while, you know, it might take 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. It's not going to take a long time, but long enough that it becomes slightly, you, you don't want to just spend your time <laughs> staring at the screen uh, here. Once the the data is is prepared, you'll see that a downloadable file appears and command files that allow us to import the data into different statistical packages uh, will appear along with a code book which when we look at how to import it into R we will we will see how to, to make use of that. So I notice I hit reload and it generates these supplemental files fairly quickly. It's still going to take a while to get the data itself, um, but I have an R file, an SPSS, a SAS, and a STATA file. Depending on the software I, I prefer to use, I can use that file to import the data uh, into my analysis software. So I'm going to stop this video, uh, this part. We have seen the, the select data function and I won't <coughs> run through a second example, uh, but you just as a refresher, you know, you hit select data. Be sure to carefully select your samples so that you are um, aware of um, which years you're actually pulling data from and walk through the process to select variables uh, via your preferred method. Um, I would typically use the subject browse lists here rather than relying on the A to Z or the search. Um, as you build up a search history, right, you can revise and resubmit um, based on uh, previous things you've done. And you go to view cart when you're ready to check out. I didn't finish this process, right? So it's given me now a warning that I didn't, I didn't add any variables. Um, and once I submit things to check out from my data cart, uh, they will appear in my account, right? So now, now you might ask, I lost that screen where it was giving me my data status. Where do I find that now? I can go to my account 
and I can here look at my data extracts. Uh, and here's my CSV file is here. Um, or I can just click on this my data. Same same link. Um, the account might be visible uh, throughout you know throughout the uh, experience. So once this is all here, I can save the links uh, to download them. Um, let me, I'll just keep them on the desktop for now. I'm going to save the R file. I'm going to save the basic code book um, because you never know, I might want that. I'm going to save the DDI code book. The DDI code book um, is going to be the one that I can import in fully formatted, uh, you know, full featured way into R. Um, and that's that's it. So I have extracted my data. Uh, this CSV file will stay there, as I mentioned, for 72 hours. Um, and now I'm ready to conduct some analysis. So our final part of this series will be using R to work with IPUM's data. And in particular, there's a R package that's called IPUM's R, very conveniently, um, that we can use to make this process easier. So I'm going to stop here, and then we can pick up with part five.